Hey everybody, welcome to another Hero Arts video. This is Lydia Fiedler and I am here to talk about the liquid watercolor. I will be using 100% cotton cold press watercolor paper for my experiments today. And I just wanted to talk to you kind of about the properties of this watercolor and what makes it unique. I love all things watercolor, so I'm always willing to try a new medium. You'll notice that I did not shake the bottle. I just kind of gently rolled it. These liquid watercolors are pigment-based, so the color comes from a pigment, not a dye. It will not fade when exposed to light. Pigments typically do settle to the bottom of liquids and can require some shaking. But the carrier in this product has been designed to keep the pigments equally suspended. So it does not require vigorous shaking, which is nice, especially if you have any kind of issues using your hands. These don't require a ton of physical exertion. Now, pigments typically blend better than dyes. Dyes can sort of dominate each other. These are like traditional watercolor in that the pigments can be blended and mixed, which you will see in my experiments. And they are archival and light fast, so they are an artist quality product. And I just have a little folding palette here that I'm adding each of the colors to. A little bit of this goes a long way. And so I'm just putting not even a full dropper full in each little well. And since yellow is kind of a universal mixer, I added a little bit more of that color. And the others will just go in the little individual wells. There is a great assortment of colors in this selection. So you'll have plenty of opportunities to see what all you can do with those colors in this video. Now to begin with, I'm just going to get my paintbrush wet and I'm just going to start with a glazing exercise. This is one of the first things that I do whenever I get a new watercolor medium because it teaches me a lot of things about the watercolor. It teaches me whether or not it's a good glazing medium, meaning does the pigment move after it's completely dry if I go over it with another color, or does it truly glaze, meaning the colors layer on top of each other to create a third new color. So I have a quarter inch flat brush that I like to make my glazing stripes with. And I'll just go all the way across the page and you can see my brush gets dry at the end and that's completely fine. I do want it to be completely dry before I go back across it with the same colors. And that is going to tell me whether or not this is a good glazing medium. And you can see as I pull down across the stripes of dry color that were already there, that the color is not smearing or pulling down or mixing with the color as I go across all of those bands of color. So that tells me this is a good glazing medium and will be fun for doing things like watercolor plaids, sort of like you see here because they really are preserving those distinct little areas where those colors cross. So that's a lot of fun and I'm getting good transparency. Next, I'll show you just the traditional uses that you would have for watercolor. And of course, that's going to include blending and mixing. So I sort of set mine up in rainbow order. And first I'm going to blend two of the colors on the palette just to show you how you can create third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh colors. And then I'm also going to show you on the paper how if you add a pure pigment, you can also mix on the paper and they blend beautifully. So I have the mixed color in the right and the two pure colors on either side. 
And you'll find that these are very, very easy to blend and easy to move around on the paper, even though they do retain their character when you dry them completely for that glazing. The colors mix, so you can see I'm getting a green just by mixing those two colors, and then I'll put the two primary colors that I used on either side just so you can see how you can get a smooth blend across that little triad. Another important thing for me is the ability of any watercolor medium to create a good neutral palette. So to get a neutral palette, you're going to mix those complementary color pairs. So in this case, I'm just choosing red and green. And you can see I get a beautiful kind of warm brown. And then you can kind of mess with your neutrals. So let's say you wanted your brown to be a little bit more green. You were going for foliage. So then you can add a little bit more green. If it went too far that way, just add a little bit of red. And then it comes back to a color very similar to what you would see just in a natural leaf. That's how you get really, really interesting neutrals is hand mixed neutrals. So I try to do that with every new watercolor medium that I get when I'm swatching. I'll do the same thing here. I'll mix that beautiful, beautiful blue with this art print brown which is sort of a purpley brown. And so it makes a beautiful gray when I mix it with the blue. And I'll go, go back and forth again, like I did with the red and green, adding just a little bit more of the art print, a little bit more of the blue. And you'll see how you can get a lot of depth and a lot of interest into a gray if you wanted to use a gray. And gray is a beautiful hand mixed color. so. I would encourage you to mix your own grays. They're going to have a lot more character than a gray that just comes out as a gray pigment that you purchase. Grays and browns are both more interesting when they're hand mixed. So the mixing properties are fantastic. I'm very happy with that. And I use regular traditional Daniel Smith watercolors quite a bit. So to me, these behave almost in an identical way. The mixing properties are good. It comes cleanly off my brush so my water is not, I don't have to change my water every five seconds. And of course salt. I had to try salt with this. The type of pigment that will react with salt is unique. So some mediums will react really well with salt, some will not. So that's one thing that I really like to test. Now I did an experiment here with a Hero Art stencil and Versamark. I just smushed the Versamark through the stencil and then let it dry completely. And I just wanted to see what the watercolor would do over the Versamark if it would give me the subtle resist that I was looking for. And it most certainly does. It gave me a very interesting background with just that subtle pattern from the stencil and the Versamark. So that is good to know. That's another of my stock experiments. And you can see that as I dry it, the pattern comes out a little more, is a little more pronounced, but is still a nice subtle pattern, very different from what you would get if you were using ink through the stencil. So that's one fun way to use these watercolors. You can see the reaction with the salt. That is working beautifully. That's going to give me some really cool texture. When you are doing salted watercolor, the best, most dramatic results are going to be when the pigment is 100% dry and absorbed by the salt. So I'm helping that along with my heat gun because I'm impatient. And here you can see what it looks like. That is a fantastic salt pattern. That is going to be a lot of fun. Now normally I would go through and I would test the salt with each color because every pigment is different. But you'd probably die of boredom in this video. So you go ahead and try it when you get them with the other colors and you'll see that they're all just a little bit different. 
Now when you're painting a lot of times you have a reason that you need to lift some color off so I test lifting too. I just have a piece of an absorber that is damp and I put down some of this mulled wine which is beautiful and it lifts great. So speaking of lifting this is my glazing chart. So now what I want to do is I want to paint just water across the glazed pigments and I want to see if it moves. And you can see I'm really not getting much movement and that's why I say that this is a great glazing medium because it's pretty it's pretty stable after you get it down. You can see a little bit of movement on this close up here, just a tiny bit. And then here's a close up of the other experiments. So now we'll just paint. We'll just have some fun. This is of course what I do daily with watercolors. So it would be crazy to leave it out of this video. And this is where you'll really get to know the pigments and be able to field test sort of their mixing properties and lifting properties and all the other things that I usually experiment with when I get a new watercolor. This stamp set is called Fun in the Rain. It's so cute. I do not have fun in the rain. I don't like rain. But I do enjoy a good pig in some rain boots hanging out with his friend the bear in the umbrella in the rain. That is the kind of rain that I like. So for this, I'm going to try to create both dark shadows and the normal shading that you would do just with a single color of watercolor like I'm doing here with the umbrella. Just adding darker pure pigment in some places and then testing to see how I can blend it out. And it blends very well. The way that I blend in watercolor and get kind of a more soft transition is I, you'll see me wiping my brush on my mat quite a bit. That gets both water and pigment off. And controlling the amount of water that you have is what will give you really, really good blends. And you can see some clouds and sun <laughs> moving across my workspace here. I'm a very slow painter. And so as my painting session went on, it would get cloudy and it would get sunny. So that's why you're seeing the lighting changes in the sped up video. But no rain this day. So that's nice. It was a very sunny day. Now I am doing some mixing of colors here to get some of the shadows on the pig. If I mix the mulled wine with the red, for example, I get a really nice pig color. And on the bear, I'm using the art print brown, which again is a very beautiful brown with almost a little hint of purple in it. And so I'm adding some of the yellow from the umbrella to the bear as well, because the light would be coming through that umbrella and shining on the bear. And it's a perfect contrast with that art print brown because then I have my complementary color scheme going into the bear. I have just a hint of purple and then I'm going to have the yellow from the umbrella. So I'll make the bear just a little bit darker, kind of away from the pig. And then add some more intense yellow up on the top to give that illusion of the reflected and shine through light from the umbrella. And there you can see me lifting a little bit where I color outside the lines. That's why you really want a good liftable watercolor is I'd love to say that most of the time I'm doing it for a technique, but the fact of the matter is that most of the time I'm doing it because I made a mistake. And that's why it's a good property to have in a watercolor. Now I'm also using the art print brown to shade the pig. This sort of unites the two images if you have one color that goes across both. And since it does have that hint of purple, it's very harmonious with the pink of the pig as well as with the bear. And then of course, a pig's rain boots have to be yellow. So I am painting these yellow and leaving little white spaces just so that they look reflective because you know how cute those shiny boots are. And then I realized that my water really wasn't kind of dark enough, leaving me 
the opportunity to have some really light spaces on it that made the water itself look reflective. So I will be going back and adding some blue pigment both under the water and to the puddles so that the pigment that's down there now can end up looking like a reflection of light on the puddle. Watercolor is a process. Never give up on a watercolor you don't think is going your way. So it was easy to fix and add some little glints of light to these puddles just by making the majority of them much darker than they are. No need to get out that white paint to make that little reflection happen. And it sort of livens up the rest of the image anyway to have that beautiful, beautiful bright blue in the mix. So there is my little scene. And here are some of the colors that you can make with these watercolors. I mixed every single color with every single other color so that you could see the huge range you get with this small collection. And these charts are so valuable when it's time to sit down and paint. You just paint an intense color on one side, an intense color on the other, and make them lighter and lighter until they meet in the middle. And you can do some really fun stuff. So here's the Versamark background. Here is a salted background with that beautiful color layering fox. And a fainter salted background with the color layering koi. And then my rain scene. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks so much for watching.